I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Book, and we're up to part two of our conversation with Rick Emmett. The reason we had to split it up is, A, his life with Triumph is huge. It takes up a lot of space, but also I've known Rick for a lot of years, and he gave me two and a half hours, so we had to split it into two parts. In this part, uh, he talks about a, a lot of his, well, growing up. I mean, growing up and being able to afford a house to his family. For his family, he bought his parents a house where his father looked at him and said, well, I guess this music thing has uh, really come to fruition. He also talks about criticizing young people's music. He's not a big fan of that. You know, he says every generation is allowed their type of music. Kim Thale of Soundgarden said some things that he was not uh, very happy with. And he'll talk about that in this segment. But a lot of triumph talk. But the book laying on the line, by the way, you can get it via the description in this video or in the podcast, if you're watching the podcast version. By the way, if you're watching podcasts, you want to see the video version, uh, both links are in the description. But he talks about laying on the line, the brand new book, and there are links, as mentioned, in the description. Part two of our conversation with the great leader of Triumph, Rick Emmett. Celebrity is a mask that eats the face, John Updike. And then I, uh, and then you had said, I was always at war with the mask on my face, there is, but you see, you're that shy kid, and I could, I so relate it. I was like, I'm riding that thing with you when I read that, and that becomes like the shy kid becomes this, the 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 movie star, the rock star. Yeah, and I think that there's a compensating kind of thing there. I think, but it's also, and writing the memoir, you know, was an educational experience for me about myself because. You start to dig into these things and you start to realize, and it's not like I haven't had some therapy of, of my own in my life. I have, you know, because I was having a lot of, especially when I got sort of into my 60s, uh, towards the end of my touring career, I, was, I had so much stress and anxiety, you know, um, and uh, it, it was clinical. I literally had to be taking medication and stuff. And why is this happening? But I think when you're a kid, and you have certain kinds of talents and abilities. The generation that came before us, that was like, oh, okay, so this is how we fix the shyness. We make him use these talents and abilities to come out of himself, to come out of his shell, to, you know, you're, you're going to have to, hey, Rick, you're going to come to church uh, choir practice with me, and you're going to be singing in the choir as a first soprano, a boy soprano. You are going to sing a solo on Sunday. Oh, you're going to be in the Christmas pageant and you're going to have a lead role, and memorize all these lines and and be the lead actor and, and sing a, a song. And, and so all of these things were starting to happen to me because I did have the ability to do it, but I, I didn't want to. I, I, you know, I, I was the last thing I wanted to do. But then now you're getting the training that you go, you put on the mask, you 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 figure out how you do this. And then you get to the point where you go, I know how this works. I'm good at this, you know. Plus, I was good at sports. And sports was all about that thing like, okay, line up for the 50-yard dash. Now you mark, get set, bang. For the next, you know, five, six seconds, you are going to absolutely give a performance that is you're totally in it. You're, you're, you're giving 100% concentration, 100% performance it's a done deal like you're all in and so i i did that when i played everything baseball football track you know i was all in to to compete in that moment you know i i didn't i played to win all the time i played to uh absolutely deliver peak performance but this also goes to something else and that is an aesthetic quality uh, an artistic kind of creative quality when I would play baseball, and I didn't care where I played, what position, I liked them all. I was a left-handed catcher a lot of them because I was the most reliable catcher on the team. So they go, well, you're going to be the catcher, you know. Oh, okay. I was, you know, I could throw it down to second base, you know, from the back of the screen if the pitcher threw it four feet outside, which happened a fair bit. So anyways, um, when I was in the outfield and there was a fly ball, and you're chasing the fly ball down and it's, you know, this ball is sailing through the blue sky. And, you know, in my mind, I have this kind of, you know, 
Forrest Gump kind of, I can picture it. Here's the ball in slow motion coming down and falling out of the sky. And here's little Ricky and he's running and his glove is outstretched. And there's going to be this moment where the ball is going to settle into my glove. I'm going to meet that ball in flight. I'm going to have given it everything I've got to get there. And it's going to be the most satisfying feeling on the planet Earth. And I don't need an audience for that. I just need the ball floating through the sky and I need to be running and I need, I just need the open field and the grass and I just need the, 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 the situation. So you apply that to music, apply that to anything in life, give me the right circumstances and I'm perfectly happy to have the performance thing happen uh, because it's the way I'm wired that aesthetically I'm going to be so happy with that achievement in that moment you know and music is totally like that that it floats in the air it only happens in this moment you know here now this is what you know so you got to bring it to this moment you've got to become the music you know and so now this is it's a it's a mask of a whole different nature there's masks we put on there's masks that, that get put on us but there's also masks we're perfectly happy to you know, yeah, yeah, give me that music mask, man. Give, give me the, the security blankets here. I love them and I will go there, you know, and I'm, you know, uh, yeah, I'm content, you know. So now you're kind of divided. You, you, you know, there's these, this guy inside you that's shy, but there's also this guy that's perfectly willing to, you know, cut his hand off in order to make it happen, you know, like, and, and of course, you've got now uh, a circumstance where you're surrounded by folks that are going, yeah, yeah, you're great. You do this. Or, yeah, no, no, you're terrific. Uh, and, hey, can I have this, please? Hey, can I? And you're doing an interview with John. He's going, hey, let me ask you this. And, you, and so you, you're, ha you're delivering because you are who you are and you've done what you've done. And, you know, so the mask is something that you go, yeah, I'm 100% I'm comfortable. It, it, it ate so far into my face that it is my face now. That's who I am. The mask is me, you know? And and you go, yeah, well, uh, can I come to terms with that? You know, because it wasn't me, you know, originally. There's parts of me inside that are, that's not me. But you go, buddy, just make life simple. Own the mask. You, you helped make it. You helped shape it. You know, you picked out the colors, you know, like, and it's true. Like being the guitar player in Triumph, was that really me? You know, I think it was way more me when I was, you know, way long after when I was going out and playing acoustic duo tours. Because before I was ever in Triumph, I was going and playing coffee houses and playing, you know, half-assed versions of, of uh, Malaguena by Roy Clark that I'd seen on Hee Haw, you know. Like I watch him on TV and, and I, you hear that na 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 and I figure it out by ear and I go, hey, I could do this Thursday night at the coffee house on my nylon string guitar. This this will probably go over really good. You know, so it's another mask, right? Really, it's another thing. But anyways. Was that me? I think that was more, more me than the guy that was, you know, standing in a hockey arena with 17,000 people going. Frunk, 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 frunk. That's interesting. It's an interesting. You know what? I always think I was told uh, earlier on because I was so nervous introducing bands because we know we're the bottom feeders of entertainment. There's like 15,000 people and we're on there and they're going, get off the fucking stage radio guy we know they're all thinking that but that's a bad way of thinking it because you you got to own whatever you do but someone once told me you're not uh, it's not what you think it is i said what stage fright he said but it's not really what you think it is because it, not that long from now you're going to be a guy who doesn't think twice about doing that a little nerves it's good it's happy it's healthy but he says you are you realize because i kept saying there's no time and space with this guy I knew we were talking about this all this metaphysical stuff and he says, why don't, you can't connect with that guy. And then one day, Ray McGuire, backstage at a Trooper concert, comes up to me and he says, he notices I'm nervous. And I'm going, oh, fuck, it makes it worse. It's making it worse. He comes up to me and I'm going, oh, no, he's coming up. He's going to talk about, because he can tell I'm nervous to introduce the band. He said, 
how did you feel when you introduced, when you went in front of the class and I'm going, oh, this is making it worse when you were a kid. And I said, well, I, I, he said, how did you feel when you sat down? I said, well, I wanted to get back up and do it over again. And he looked at me and he says, well, I look forward to you introducing us for a second time. And it blew my mind. I'm going, <laughs> I, you don't need, it's all these tricks. Like you're in the church. Uh, it's it's all these little blocks that lead to, you, you know what? Uh, rock stars always say, you know, I, I hate to call you guys rock, but musicians always tell me they're going, you know, you ask the, the topic, the typical, oh, do you, could you ever imagine this would have happened to you in your life? It's such a typical question. But it's true. If if I if someone would have whispered in your ear before you got into church, oh, by the way, you're going to do all these things, your freaking brain would explode. Steps, yeah. steps, steps, steps. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, first of all, you mentioned Ray McGuire, and I always liked him. I always thought that guy was really cool and really together, and and you know, uh, and they had some great hits too, man. Wow, they had, and of course, uh, one of my favorite stories from Gill was that he was at some, you know big thing like a, a walk of fame dinner or something you know and uh some guy is up making a speech and it's it's a big person it's like you know i i can't remember who it was but you know somebody sort of big and important a celebrity and then he's look and he's do, doing one of those things where he's looking around the room and he's seeing people and he's going oh and uh you know we're, it's great we've got this guy here tonight you know oh, i loved you when, when you were in uh uh, you know MacGyver, and oh, we go, and he goes, oh, and we've got uh, Gilmore from Trooper here. Fantastic, love that band Trooper there, Gil. Oh no, <laughs> bands that start with TR. <laughs> you know. Oh, that's hey, you wrote Gilmore. self discipline begins with self awareness, delayed gratification, and learning how to say no. That's that those things. I mean, you know what you. you uh, I'm not going to say you dumbed it down, but you need to have it in a sentence. I always say you need to the, the 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 hard to say no. I mean, listen, I just told you I did 30 interviews in 40 days. It seems it's out of control. I can't keep up with this. There's no, it's impossible. But I learned to use discipline to sort of going no. I like doing this. This is fun. When I read that self discipline, self awareness, delayed gratification, which don't eat your cake first, and learning how to say no, how to uh, tell me about that. Well, I mean, when you teach uh, music business courses at a college level, you're eventually going to arrive at things where you go, all right, you know, um, what needs to be on the curriculum that's true is going to be true for everybody across the board, you know, and those kinds of, of um, uh, I, you know, I don't know what you'd call them tenets uh, uh you know r rules you know I, I, rules are made to be broken and and there's no such thing as rules in a business where everybody's story is a unique story you know but um i do think there are some things that become kind of self-evident and um i would do uh like in the early days when i was first building curriculum for the course i would look around and find things and there was a guy in uh Berkeley in the States that taught a uh, self-promoting, Peter Spellman taught a, a self-promoting musician kind of course. And he had a book and uh, there were good things I got out of that book. And one of them was he talked about Ford Motor Company had done a study about how do you, what separates, um, you know, successful people from people that aren't. And Ford had paid big money to have, you know, uh, psychologists and folks do clinical studies to try and get to the bottom of what makes a successful person successful. And that study proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that successful people wrote shit down. <laughs> That's like, you have goals? Okay, write them down. That's it. And if you do it, if you write them down, they become real. And now you you can you have a focus for them and they, they've taken but the the people that don't, the people that are kind of lazy and they they never get around to it or they go, well, that's stupid. I'm not going to do that. Well, then they're probably not going to be successful because successful people make lists. Successful people write down. Successful people keep journals. Successful people plan things out and write those plans down. They have agendas. They that's you know, and I've always been that kind of a person. So 
And I'm saying, I'm not that special. I'm really not. I stand up in front of students and I say, here's the kinds of things that I can make this simple for you. You know, so that was the first one. That was the key, the, the one about writing things down and becoming a, 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 a list person, a journaling person, those kinds of things. And that led to the other things where, you, you know, you, you check out studies and you realize, oh, you know, th this is this is what separates the wheat from the chaff. And of course, that leads you to the psychology studies of little kids where they sit them down in a room and they go, OK, here's a candy. You can have one candy. But if, if you won't take it, I'm going to leave the room. I got to go and do something. But don't eat the candy. When I come back, I'll give you two. But, you know, and so they do studies to go, the kids that eat the candy right away, as soon as the person leaves the room, versus the kids that learn about delay, or they have delayed gratification as a, they see the value in it, or they believe in the value of it. So the teacher comes back and gives them two. And so they're ahead of the game. Those kids are probably going to get university degrees. Those kids are going to be the ones that make more money in life. They're the ones that are going to be more successful. So you, you get a study like that. And so I would stand up in front of a room full of, you know, 35 to 40 people that are, you know, the other side of 20, but haven't got to 30 yet. And I would say, okay, folks, you want a secret of life? Here it is, delayed gratification. You know, like be willing to work today for something that is not going to pay off for another six months. Because I can tell you from experience, that was the story of triumph. That that was an absolute kind of thing that existed that we shared. Everybody was willing to go. Yeah, I mean, in 1978, uh, I was living in a rented house, and my wife and I. She had a job, daily job, and I, I was sitting around waiting for gigs and waiting for the American record deal to land. And and I, I'd have to grocery shop using my ChargeX Visa card, you know, and and um. We were buying our groceries on credit because we had no money, none, zero, you know. And it was like uh, thinking, oh, boy. But I had faith that, you know, this triumph thing was going to work. And by the end of 1979, I had a house sitting on well, in an acre of land, you know, and I had a nice car in the driveway. And my what wife was it, by the way? Car. Curious. The first. First car that I bought, well, the first car that I got when I was in Triumph was a, a, a Thunderbird. It was a Ford Thunderbird. It wasn't very good, uh, but it was brand new. Um, and then the next one I got was a, a Camaro Berlinetta, which could go like stink, but it was also bad car. That was the drive. classy, uh, that was known as the classy, the classiest of the Camaro, the Berlinetta. Yeah. It was the fast one. It was, yeah. it was the lightest, you know. Man, also on um, just snowy roads, <laughs> just woo, you know. Um, then I think the next one I got was uh, a Jaguar, a Vanden Plaus, 12 cylinders. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, and these things were happening relatively quickly in my life, you know, like that I was moving up in the world. And so was my wife, by the way. Her cars were also getting, you know, nicer. So, anyhow. And saying no. So learning how to say no is um, that whole thing where, you, you know, you're a, a, an artist and you're uh, you're wanting to make people happy and you're wanting to appease and you're wanting to uh, gain approval and all of those kinds of things. And so then you get into this thing where there's just too many people asking you for things and you're saying yes to all this stuff. And now it's getting out of control and there's all of the stress and anxiety because you've taken on too much, you know, you can't handle it. It's getting inhuman. And so that's a big lesson of how do you learn how to say no? But the other th way, thing about it too is let's say you're trying to build something and you're trying to, uh, Project an image. You're trying to have an artistic uh, territory where you go, this is who I am and this is what I want to be. Now, and I would often use examples in my classes, David Bowie, Madonna, they could reinvent themselves, but they were never uncomfortable in these in these personas that they could create. They were always like absolutely 100 percent committed to the thin white duke or the spider from Mars or like these things that they could make themselves be this in a, an incredibly convincing show business kind of way. 
But then you've got somebody that says, no, I don't want you to be the thin white duke. I want you to be the spider from Mars. Will you go back and do that? And you have to say, no, no, I won't. And you have to know who you are and what you want and be able to put that ahead of what somebody else wants from you. Even then I go, well, I'll give you a million dollars if you'll, if you'll be the spider from Mars. And you go, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm, I moved on from that. I, and, the, you know, the, my rules thing, I should have had one more, which is, you know, it, money is not the thing that makes the final determination. It should never be the thing that makes you decide I'm going to do it. Sometimes it can be because you, you need the money and you can use the money to fuel something else. You know, but uh, it, it'll give you the working budget to do what you really, really want to do, you know. Um, but in some ways, you must protect yourself. And one of the ways you protect yourself is learning how to say no. The other way is to say, well, I don't need that money. I don't want that money. I found it kind of interesting in Triumph, you guys would be naming obscure hockey cards of original six players just to entertain yourselves in the early days. The stuff that people do, huh? I know. Well, and, and you know, in those days, Triumph never, we, we were no good with tour buses. So we, we always flew. And and in fact, Mike and his wife were kind of like travel agents in any case. And so he would be able to find us flights and book them. And, and we would fly everywhere, the three of us. And then you'd get to some place and you'd rent a car. And then you might need the rental car to drive from one place to another, do a drop off. And, you know, Lord knows where in Minnesota, you know, because you couldn't get flights. So we'd have these long car rides. And, and how do you what do you do to kill the time? And that was one of the kind of natural ones you'd get there and you'd be playing these games and it would be like, oh yeah, Eddie Litzenberger. And go, oh yeah, Eddie Litzenberger. Oh yeah. oh yeah. How about Vic Stasiak? Oh yeah, Vic Stasiak. Because it was the original six, right? Yeah. And and everybody kind of knew the guys in the original six. You couldn't possibly play that game now because man, the rosters turn over and there's, I don't know, what, 173 teams now, you know, like there's just, you know, so anyways, but it was, it was fun. And those were the things that made being in a band a lovely, you know, like in a way, uh, you, we ended up at loggerheads and it wasn't good and, and it broke up and but when you get back together, the thing that's sweet about that is you have those things that you share that were the foxhole things, you know, the things that were when you were in the trenches together, you know, uh, and when you were musketeers and you go, oh, yeah, those were good. That was that was awesome. That was great. You know, it was stupid. It was juvenile, but it was it was so much fun, you know. You mentioned, uh, well, first of all, I saw James Taylor in 92 as well. Uh, outside the PE, outside concert. With, I think Valerie Carter, who we lost a few years ago, she's lost a few people in his backup singing band. Uh, but I, I think she was still alive and singing with him. And JT by James Taylor, you know, Russ Kunkel's drums on there, Honey, Don't Leave LA, like, like syndrome kind of drumming sounds. That is such a great album. Yes. Oh, yeah. I got to meet Russ Kunkel. He, he was out on tour with. Um... Uh, uh, Lyle Lovett and the guy that was road managing Lyle was my road manager for a long time and my front house mix guy Mike Spinarski and uh, and Mikey you know you were talking earlier about things he had a heart attack when he was out on the road and of all the people that to take him to the hospital Leland Sklar was the guy that took him to the hospital you know saying I think you've got a heart attack man I think I think I should get you to the hospital so Leland took him but anyways I mean the, those guys Tremendous musicians, like just, you know, and salt of the earth kind of guys. That that rhythm section that played on Linda Ronstadt records and James Taylor records, you know. And part of that was you know, like Peter Asher was kind of, you know, he was James Taylor's kind of manager and, and producer. Yeah. And that's the same Peter Asher that was Peter of Peter Gordon. That was Peter Asher that's the sister Jane was dating Paul McCartney. So it is a kind of a small world in some ways, you know. Um, I'm doing a thing on Asia. Uh, Gaucho I liked, but everyone, it's so cool. Everyone says, I like Gaucho, but Asia's the album. And it's, for the most part, if you look at sales, I mean, that's the way it went. Like anything you want to share? Because I'm doing, I've got like 30 people talking about Asia. 
and I'd like to include you. Uh, well, one of my favorite albums of all time would be one of my desert island classic kinds of things, you know. Um, and I have had the great pleasure of performing in a, in a band called Pretzel Logic, which is a Steely Dan cover band, where I got to get up and sing Deacon Blues and and um, and then older stuff, too, from, from other records, like uh, never going back to my old school, you know, like uh, my wife and I both had a, a, a deep affection for uh, the the Pretzel Logic album. Uh, I even maybe can't buy a thrill. I think in our early days, those vinyl albums would get played a lot. You know, talking before. to Jeff Skunk Baxter, and he educated me a little bit because I got the I got a song wrong on the year. I didn't buy Can't Buy a Thrill, the first one, uh, and and then Katie lied. I remember there was another one I got mixed up in because yeah. I started with Asia, and then I went back a little bit, but not as much as I should have. Yeah, so like no, but I, I was a fan before that with that had the reeling in the years and all and all that stuff. And then there there was the one that had Kid Charlemagne on it and the Fez and and Haitian Divorce and oh man, that was a great record. I can't remember the title of it, but I'm and I still every now and then when I'm going to listen to some music, those will be the tracks that I you know that's this kind of the soundtrack of not my childhood but of my early adulthood. So you never, you never, you never partied. You, you, uh, you know, Ian Anderson told me he never partied at all. I smoked my fair bit of dope from, you know, 16 on to about 26, 27, 28. But it was no fun after a while. I would just but No, but you had said, you had said you're doing a job when you were in the band. Oh yeah. Playing gigs and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, part of it too is, because I sang so high and I really had to front the band and run around a lot. It was like being a, j a jock, an athlete. And so it was like, I can't get hammered or I can't get stoned. I, like I got to save this because I got to do this again tomorrow night, and, you know, wherever Peoria, you know, like, so I, 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 you know, I can't. And in any case, I didn't really want to, I didn't really like it, you know, like I didn't feel liberated. I felt like, uh oh, I'm damaging stuff. <laughs> you know, like I'm wrecking my liver. Oh, I, I think I'm getting a brain tumor. You know, like I, I, I just didn't like the idea of not being in control of my own body. Maybe that's the jock in me, right? That, you know, you, you really love the feeling of being able to control your body, you know? So I, now as I'm getting older and there's arthritis and, prostate cancer and you know, these kind of things and you go oh geez you know like i'm not in control of my own body and i'm not you know like eventually it's gonna get you you know yeah. and you lose control but while i'm here and while i had that ability to control my body i wanted to keep it i want you know i liked it i wanted to that's the kind of person i wanted to be in that kind of a body and that kind of a mind i didn't want it to be uh you know Altered. <laughs> altered okay off the record you don't have cancer do you yeah. you do yeah yeah oh, i didn't know that yeah and i don't mind if it's on the record I, I have to take medications and stuff you know i've just had another biopsy done i'm going to find out in a couple of weeks whether or not it's going to have to come out or stay and you know a, a men my age everybody should be getting checked regularly like you got to try and stay ahead of it and i am ahead of it but my dad had it for like 20 years the end of his life you know uh, I, I'm hoping I've just got that slow growing kind. You know, there's a statistic. I think it's like 80% of, of, of men's uh, bodies when they're old, when they do autopsies, they have some form of prostate cancer. It's just, if you live long enough, you're probably going to get it. But, you know, um, so it doesn't freak me out. Uh, it would freak me out if somebody sat me down and said, yeah, it's moved. We're finding it in other places now because I've been there with my brothers and my mom. And, and, you know, like you go, well, that's not good. <laughs> you know, how much time have I got? You know, I was just talking to Terry Brown two days ago saying, how did they keep that under wraps? I said, how did they keep that? No one knew. He says, I didn't even know that he was sick. Yeah. He yeah. says, I didn't know that. Well, he had you know, Those are individual choices. And, and certainly the, you know, the rush camp, they knew how to play things close to the vest. Their whole life, anybody that they ever hired had to sign the NDAs, you know. Like, they knew uh, 
they were just on a whole other level, you know, and, but, you know, and I know Alex a little bit and I know that Alex is friends with like Dave Gilmore of Pink Floyd. And I know that those, they could travel in those circles and get, you know, uh, advice and, and, and insight, you know, and Ray Daniels would be able to get it on those levels, you know, so that they would go. Uh, so maybe this is a good way to deal with it. This is a good way for us to cope because, Neil was not the kind of guy that wanted to live a public kind of life. He he didn't even like doing interviews and he didn't like going to meet and greets. He didn't like any of that stuff. You know, Terry it says he barely knew him. Terry Brown, their producer for the heyday says, I didn't know yeah. Neil appeared that well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, he's going out and doing a book tour and that blew my mind. I went really? Okay. Wow. Okay. You know, but I think part of it is now that the rush thing is done, I think both uh, Getty and Alex, they've kind of relaxed in a way that when Neil was part of it, they couldn't relax because Neil was not a relaxing kind of guy. Neil was wired in a certain way that he, I mean, I've read his books. Uh, I'm on ECW Press, which, you know, uh, that was also the company that, that uh, Neil was with, you know, the for his books. And um yeah, I think he was a private kind of a man, you know, and so I think it made it so that Rush realized, well, we have to respect that. That's 33 and a third of what we're about, you know, so. Yeah. You didn't have to do the, I know they, the other two guys in the band were, and I've talked to, you know, Gil and, and Mike, Mike twice, Gil once, uh, not as many times as Rick Ahmed, but, you know, come on. Um, but the That's songwriting thing, thing, John, what's that? I said, that's as it could be, John. <laughs> yeah. the, when splitting the songwriting, I mean, and I know they did these other things, obviously, and there were big things what they did. You know, did you ever have second choice, of, second thoughts of doing that? I mean, because you were singing the hits. No, I, you know, at the time, uh, what I was trying to do was protect and, and, and um, service the Musketeers ethos, you know, like this was, what we were all about and so in my way i was saying hey guys look at this grand gesture that i can i'm making here you know so you know don't screw me okay <laughs> like don't you are in a position where things come across your desk and you know there, there's deals that are going down and there's lots of money that is on your table sometimes you know don't do me any dirties you know because i'm not i'm gonna be a musketeer with you guys, you know, and I don't want to fight the way the Beatles ended up fighting, you know, and, and George Harrison feeling like he was, you know, getting short shrift. You know, here comes the sun is the biggest uh, Beatles song on Spotify. Yeah, no, I know that. Yeah. And so, you know, and the, the police had ended badly because, you know, guys in the band were making noises and Sting didn't want to share and, you know, and maybe he didn't have to make me in his mind and the way that thing worked. Um, maybe he is, is perfectly justified. You know, that's not for me to say. All I know is that when I was in Triumph, I go, well, the, a, a smarter thing to be do to do would be to split the songs, split the songwriting. I thought what it was going to do was make it so that we wouldn't be fighting about who's going to be the lead singer, whose song is going to be the, the lead single, you know, um, I thought I was helping that kind of uh, chemistry. And in the end, it didn't. You know, that was that was a regret. You know, I went back ah, too bad, you know, but I never regretted the fact that I was splitting the songwriting for the tunes like, you know, they never got laying on the line and hold on and suitcase. You know, the stuff from Just a Game remained mine right. and it always has. I was talking with the people from ECW. Mm -hmm. Because they're, the book's already going into a second printing, right? Which oh, is cool. a lovely thing. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but, but I was talking to them about one of the things that I used to teach about, which is the, the long tail theory. Do you know about that, Chris Anderson? The guy no, no, used no. to be the, he was the editor of Wired magazine. Yeah, and his theory was that, you know, because we live in the digital age, there's this thing of of uh, something comes out and you know you you might not have a lot of money you're trying to compete against the people that do don't worry about it just you know get try to get um, early adopters early adopters get into your thing now you can use the digital world to to spread the word uh, you know then you, you get you know the the middle people I can't remember what they're called the the middle adopters and then you get late adopters 
even as the thing, and then you have this nice long tail where you can keep working the product, you know, music, a book, whatever, um, it, because you can find your demographic and your demographic will find you the, uh, um, because those things are available. The internet makes it so that those things can happen. Digital technology makes it so that they can happen. So, um, yeah, I used to teach that. And, and you know, when I was talking to uh, ECW, I was saying, you know, yeah, I can do an interview with John and I know he can cut like seven or eight clips out of it and they'll come out over time. And I go, that's good. That's not a bad thing. You know, 20. So put him on the day so that I don't have anything else after. So, no, I, I could get 20 out of this. Ron, the producer that could have been, that never was. You know, I didn't mind Gills just one night. I'd forgotten it. I I forgot it. I mean, obviously, you're my favorite singer in that band, but but uh, I had listened to it this morning. I went, oh yeah, I remember this. Uh, tell me about that. Well, you know, Ron's thing was that he he could find songs that he would bring to projects, and then uh, produce them in the way that in the style uh, that he liked to do it. And if you listen to, like, here's a weird thing about Ron Nevison records. There, there's never any hi-hat and there's never any cymbal crashes. Like, there's never any drum rolls. Never. Like, listen to the Starship hits, listen to the heart songs. Like, you know, uh, like the, the Starship song, um, uh, Sarah, you know. Sarah! Uh, and and uh, there, we built this city. You know, like those kinds of records, they don't have, uh, he, he, it was just the way he worked and it was the, his style of doing things. But he would find these songs from outside writers and bring them into the band and say, this is going to be a hit. This will be a hit. You know, I'm going to produce it in a certain way and it'll get radio airplay. And he turned the trick. So the song Just One Night was one of the ones and right from the get-go, we liked it. It was a song that was written by Neil Sean, Eric Martin, the singer from Mr. Big, who on the demo, I went, this is incredible. Like this should have been a hit, you know, when this came out, like I don't understand why it wasn't, you know, and there was a third writer too. Uh, I'm not sure it was Tony Finucci or somebody like that. I, I don't know the guy. Anyhow. Um, so, you know, uh, it was like, well, who's going to sing this? And so when we were cutting beds in LA, Ron came to me and he said, look, I want you, the songs that I've brought to the project. I want you to make sure they're all cut in keys that you can sing. Because, you know, you're going to be the singer. And I went, whoa, 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 that's not going to fly. <laughs> you know, that's just not. Like, Gil's going to want the songs that he's kind of already been laying claim to and working out the keys that they're going to be cut in and stuff. Uh, he's not going to give those up. Like, and so he said, well, you leave that to me. And I went, oh. And we got on the plane and we were flying back from L.A. And I thought, I better broach this subject with Gil. I better, you know, like try to make him aware that this is what's coming. And so when I did, Gil was really unhappy that it was like. Uh, um, you didn't go into was, what was you didn't. I mean, obviously, it's none of our business, but you, you purposely didn't say what was said on that plane. Well, he, it was like he thought I was being a traitor. And like now it was like I was the guy that was betraying the three musketeer ethos you know and i was going no no that's not what this is about i'm talking about the future of the band being signed in a record deal to mca and mca wanting to do they've brought in nevison because this is and this is what nevison wants and this is what the record company wants and if you fight this you're going to be going against the record company and, and there was Gil that three well, million dollar to thing me. too there was that little thing that little three million dollar buying you from rca Totally, yes. Hanging there like the uh, the sword of Damocles, you know, like uh, the, the financial sword of Damocles. Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, um, yeah, it's, in the end, you know, um, there's no guarantee that if I'd sung the tune, it, it would have been a hit. But, um, you know, uh, I wrote Somebody's Out There later, and then that was the lead single hit. And it was the highest charting song that Triumph ever had. So I, maybe it wasn't even a question of getting airplay. It, it was maybe more a question of first you got to get, get airplay with one thing. 
Then you got to have to get airplay with another. The power ballad was usually the third card that got played, you know, for the Def Leppard record or the Shania Twain record or the Brian Adams record or, you know, like that was the formula and it worked. You know, I, I, I think What About Love was the big one that launched Heart, but then the one that really made the album sales take off was the one that um, Nan uh, Nancy These Dreams. Said, right? not, not the yeah, Nancy these sang dreams. These Dreams, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was the one that was the big hit. And apparently that created some uh, unhappy energy between the sisters too like you know it happens in bands you know ah ego what a strange thing bruce colburn bruce is I, I know you said he's an intense guy i had an interview i had a chance to interview him and it, it fell through for whatever reason but before the interview and nothing against him he's brilliant great guitarist like you mentioned i love his christmas album it's crazy good um i'm not a big christmas albums guy but it's good and I really noticed his guitar, it's weird, on his Christmas album. And I went, oh, yeah, he's a great guitarist. What, what, what was it like working with him? No, uh, working with Bruce, uh, you know, I talk about it in the book. It, we did it sort of with his band. So he had a level of comfort when we were on the TV studio floor, uh, which I didn't. I was I was nervous and... and um, and I could tell, like, at one point he, he asked me if I would please turn my amp down, you know, because I was too loud. And I was a rock guy, you know, I really was. And I can't remember the year that I did that, 85 maybe, 80, somewhere around there, 85, 86. Um, but, you know, uh, I mean, he'd always sort of been a, a, a hero figure to me, a singer-songwriter in the Canadian scene where, you know, in the early days, there was Gordy Lightfoot, and then the next sort of generation of guys was it was Bruce Colburn. He was the guy, you know, the finger style picking. Oh you know, yeah, an early so one. Good. Yeah, yeah, an, uh, yeah. Uh, I, uh, yeah, and he did that uh, going. What's it going down the road movie? I'm going down the tree. Na, 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 na. I'm going to the country. The light shine on me, and I'm. I'm I would go to see him in concert because I wanted to hear that song. That was just such a great, great tune. But it was great, great guitar playing that you could sing and play like that. Like he had that sort of, it's Booker White or Clarence White or it's one of those guys, you know. The, the folk guys that I didn't really know, he knew, you know, and he, he'd schooled himself on that. But he was also a Berkeley guy, right? He'd gone to Berkeley and, and studied some music and... um so the, the guy had chops and he had a, a, a really clear, concise kind of mind, you know, and I loved his lyric writing. I, you know, part of my lyric writing influence was certainly Bruce Coburn, you know, so to play with him was a little intimidating, uh, but it was also uh, a great, great thrill of my life that, you know, like we did one of his things, uh, Dear Dancing Around a Broken Mirror, and he played, and I played, um, like, uh, my uh, my uh, resonator guitar with slide, and he played his fingerstyle, and it was a really nice marriage of things. And then later, he hired Colin Linden to be in his band, and Colin would be playing resonator things with a little bit of blues slide and stuff, and I went, and I think he got the idea of that from when I did the TV show. Man, yeah, who knows? I mean, Dancing in the Dragon's probably, Jaws from with the Wondering Where the Lines Are. To me, that 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 album, there is not a weak track on that album. I just, I've got all his earlier albums. Look, I got to jam on, on a live TV show. Mama just wants to barrel house all night long. Yeah. And I went, oh, and this is as good as good gets, you know, like fantastic. I just found my George Benson interview. I thought I lost it. It was during the Canadian Smooth Jazz Awards, and we, it was the first time where we were giving him the award. And uh, I finally got a chance to have him. And just as a point of interest, um, the person who set up the interview said, "Okay, if, he, if you find he's getting tired because he doesn't like, he doesn't dislike interviews, uh, ask him about being a JW." And I said, "Well, I don't have a quote about a Jehovah's Witness, so I'll ask him." She says, "You'll have him again because he gets excited." And no disrespect to George, it makes sense. I'm going to his faith; it's important. He told me, "I said, well, why?" I, you know, I said, "I don't know anything about JWs. Why are you a JW? Just want to know." 
And he says, oh, no, of course. Uh, he says, because I know what my fellow Jehovah's Witness is thinking across the world or something like that. I'm going, I didn't ask him to elaborate. I'm going, what the hell? Tell me about George Benson. Well, first I want to comment about what you were saying, because I, I, I once wrote a, a lyric in a tune. It was called, uh, oh, I'm not going to remember, One Man Band, I think, on, on my Good Faith album. And it was about a street musician. And there was a line in there about, you know, he's out there on the street playing his music trying to balance the need to belong with the longing to be free. And I've always felt that was a, 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 a strong observation about humanity that we do, we all want to, we have this unique uh, personal thing that we are, and we know that there's nobody else on the planet Earth like us, you know, but by the same token, we want a family so that we can belong. We want to join that team so that we can belong. We we want to, you know, dress like this so that we can belong. That whole peer group thing. Like uh we we want to win a jazz award so that we can belong to this, you know, this this secret society that has its own demographic, you know. And um anyways, uh George has a spirit in his playing that is just a completely fearless kind of playing. And there's like, when I, when he jammed with me on stage in Buffalo at the guitar festival there that night, he'd already played up the street at Shays and I was playing at the Trough, which is, you know, the short for Trough Almador, which was the name of the nightclub in one of the Douglas Adams hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy. Anyway, so the Trough and he, and he gets up on the stage and, and he, he leans into my ear and he says, give me the God. And I go, what? Like, give me the God. What does he mean? Like, like Madison Square God? What, what is he talking about? And then I realized, oh, he he must have been here from earlier in the show when I played my nylon string, Godet guitar, <laughs> you know, the Godet. And I go, oh, he wants the Godet. So my nylon string class, we get up. like I had an arch top jazz guitar ready to go. Nope, didn't want that wanted to uh, go there so he puts it on and it's hilarious right from the get-go because my strap we're not we're about the same height but george is a big boy like he's thick you know big broad-shouldered thick kind of a guy um he like he's not fat but he but he's he's, he's just thick right so he puts the guitar on and the guitar is like right here on his chest like when he puts it on and he's looking at me and he's making these videos like Oh my God, I can't believe what I got, you know. And then he starts playing, and oh my God, he's already completely warm. He's already done, you know, uh, bump, bump Broadway. He's already done, you know, as the encore thing for his own show and played the shit out of it, probably, you know. So when he gets to my thing, he's already liquid mercury you know gets the guitar on and he starts doing the tune and he's just frying the guitar like he's just killing it and it's so great and i'm going oh man i can't believe i'm on stage with george benson and, hey george benson is playing my guitar hey look george benson is looking at me and winking hey you know it was just it was crazy it was unbelievable oh and i i'm gonna tell you this story too because you know i'm not sure if i've ever told this one out, you know, in public, um, I, I the band like I, I didn't know what we were going to play, but when he was walking up through the club and I was introducing him, and he's got these you know, couple of you know uh, linebacker football player guys bodyguards walking him through the crowd, and I'm going, ladies and gentlemen, here he comes, the one and only Mr. George Benson, and the place is going crazy, and my heart is just you know, I'm going okay, and and he comes up the ramp and he asks me for the guitar and stuff. And um, I didn't I didn't know what we were going to play. But when he was walking up, my keyboard player, Marty Anderson, goes, unk, unk, tick -tick 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 unk, unk. My drummer goes, flip, boom, 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 boom. And here we go. Like, it's clearly going to be Broadway, right? We're doing that. I go, OK. And I didn't know what key it was. I'm looking around trying to figure out the bass part. Okay, oh, we're in G. Okay, great. So I've, I'm, I'm starting to play. He gets the guitar. He knows what key it's in. But the version of the song that he does has modulations built into it. It's going like bump, bump, and it gets through a, a chorus, and then it goes bump, 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 
but my mom, my mom it moves up, right? So I'm looking around and I'm thinking, okay, I'm, I'm going to show George that I'm hip, I'm cool, right? So I'm looking around at the guys in the band and I'm looking at them and I'm going, we're going to go up, okay? We're going to go up. And I'm looking around and we're going to go up, okay? And they're all going, okay, we're going to go up. And just as we, were, we, we decide to go up and I give everybody the high sign, George steps to the mic and starts going, they say the neon lights are bright. So he starts singing in the old key, and we've all gone up. Okay. And I go, oh, no, back, 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 back down, back down, back down. It's like, it only lasted for about a second, you know, but it was the second that PBS had their camera running. I'm going, oh, this is, oh, this is bad. Oh, geez. And I just, I just stepped right in it. And boy, it was very smelly. But anyhow. George, he was great. He, he never, I don't think he noticed, to be honest, because he was you know, He's in the zone. stepping on the, yeah, doing his thing, right? And, and you know, one last thing about George and one last, something happened with Breezen when I was like 15 years old when that came out. I remember all my rock friends bought Breezen. Yes. Everyone had yeah. Breezen. Well, I, I have my theories about this, right? And um, I've been dealing with this all my life of Guitar heroism, the, the the virtuoso guitarist, which is a thing that exists in our culture. And especially because at a certain point in time, there was Hendrix and Clapton and to a slightly lesser degree, uh, Beck and Page, right? The, the Yardbirds guys and Hendrix, those four guys. And they established something that became a meme for all of the music industry in all the countries of the world for the rest of time, guitar heroism, you know? Um, and so uh, in the in the wake of that, you had guys like Steve Vai, Joe Satriani, Yngwie Malmsteen, you, the, you know, you can just keep naming names and th they're essentially guitar heroes, you know? And they become, uh, they're not mainstream. They never have, you know, hit songs on the top 10, but they have fantastic careers and they do really, really well. Okay. so. That kind of leaks over because there was always a world where there was, you know, the jazz guitar, the, the downbeat poll, you know, who would get the downbeat critics poll and Benson would win, you know, he, he was barely out of his teens when he started winning that thing. Right. So he already had a reputation that made him in a cult way. He was this he was the man. You know, he was the guitar hero of the of the guitar heroes in that genre. And everybody knew that they should be respecting here in Canada. Eddie Bickert. Uh, uh, I don't think I should say Eddie because no one called him Eddie. <laughs> Ed, Ed, Mr. Bickert uh, and Lenny Bro and those kinds of folks, you know, like uh, they didn't sell a lot of records, but everybody respected who they were and. and then Benson was one of those kind of guys, except on a global scale. And he, you know, I mean, he's played with Miles Davis. He, you know, he, he was the guy. But then the genius was really Tommy LaPuma. He was the record producer of Breezen. And he was the guy that sort of understood, okay, if I bring in Klaus Ogerman and we do string parts that, you know, and if you think about that Breezen record, it had all of these beautiful, you know, Doodly, 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 like little birds singing and stuff and and strings and and then uh, wafting you know bump 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 dun 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 and there'd be reason uh, a booby, da, da, da. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. you know these melodies that were just like and tommy and klaus made that happen i mean george would just go out on the studio floor and jam and these tunes and he would do a lot of cover songs you know uh Masquerade was a cover song. Uh, the the yeah. big hit, Leon Russell, was, right? If I remember, yeah, yeah, that uh, yours, uh, yeah, and, and Masquerade. But um, the the one that was a big hit, uh, it was a Gabor Jabot tune from, and he was this kind of jazz guy. But you know, Tommy and George figured out, oh, we'll do an arrangement like this, and and. This could be a, a, a it could be a hit single, and it was, you know. So, um, anyhow, I mean, I was a rock guy, and in 1976, for my uh, honeymoon, the Breezen album was the one. And I don't know if you ever did this, but 
you put the record on and, and when it's playing, if you lifted that arm that could hold all the albums together that we're going to drop and you just moved it back, it would just play the same album over yeah. and over and over and over. So that's what my wife and I did for the uh, side one of, of the Breezin album when we were upstairs in the bedroom on our honeymoon. <laughs> and that was the oh. soundtrack. for. And I wrote that, uh, I told my guy to tell the promoter of the thing they make sure George hears that story because I think that'll be compelling. And apparently the promoter, oh, I'm not going to remember his name. He was the guy that ran the PBS station, Dawn something. Anyhow, he, he wrote it on a note and stapled it to the check that Benson was going to get paid with uh, that night, for his road manager. So the road manager gets the check, but it's got a staple in it with this note that says, hey, Rick Emmett's playing up the street. Breezen was his you know, honeymoon record. You know, George should go up and jam with the guy, you know. And so George did, you know. So, but the thing, of course, with, with music is that, you know, it's touching right on the subjective nerves. And so then everybody kind of goes like, well, this is my turf. This is my thing. You know, don't mock me. Don't belittle me, you know. So then what they start to think is, well, if that guy's playing that kind of outlandish style of stuff and it's, you know, the the the, the absolute opposite of what I do, then hey, they're ma they're ma they're making fun of me or they're making the world a worse place for me and my stuff. So, we're at war. I must fight them. And you go, "No, that's, you know, now you're really going off on the wrong thing. It's music, you know, people like this is all about we're all going to get along like if we're going to try to make room for people with different color skin and people of different genders and like surely to God, we can make room for people that like, there was once a thing in guitar player magazine with a guy from Soundgarden, Kim Thale had said something along the lines of, um, you know, all oh, the music that the little girls go to the mall and the kind of music that they listen to, you know, that's bullshit. Like that's horrible. Like, you know, that, 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 that should never be, you know, to which I, you know, in the pages of Guitar Player Magazine, I said, I honestly, I, I want to try to nip this kind of talking in the bud. I, you know, I don't think that's the right way to think about anything at all. A little girl that goes to the mall that has music that she likes, she's absolutely 100% entitled to her own subjective thing that she, that she likes. And she's finding out about music. She's loving music. Do you think the Swifties of the world now are not going to find their way to other music. They are, you know, as they grow up, because they love music so much, they are eventually going to, they might even find their way to the Smiths. They might even find their way to Miles Davis. You never know, you know, they might not, but because you love music, the door is open. And that's what it's supposed to be about. Open doors, open windows, open hearts, open minds, like open, 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 open. Not closed. Stop being so closed. It's such bullshit. The reunion, I saw the, one of the magazines say, oh, Rick Emmett was just, a, you know, he was not part. Did you see that video that just came out? Some of you interviewed. They, they're they trying to get hits. The gist of it was you, did, you don't have a stake. And you told me that way back in the smooth jazz times. You didn't have a stake in Triumph. Uh, but how did you find the, re the, how was the reunion documentary? How did you find the whole experience? It was easy. It was, it was fun. It was, uh, I was doing it purely out of love and respect for the other guys. And um, I was going to enjoy the process and uh, I was going to try to mind my P's and Q's, you know, this is a slightly different thing now. This is my memoir and I'm telling my story. It's not the same thing as, you know, uh, something that's going to be leavened by all three guys telling their story. And then, you know, Banger Films taking a documentary uh, and, and final approval is going to be Gil and Mike, you know, and I think that's what the guy was referring to a question where he was saying, well, you know, who had final approval of that or, you know, or how much were you getting, you know, how much do you get paid when a Triumph album comes out? Just, you know, whatever. And I'm going, I, I don't have a piece of it. It doesn't, you know, that's not the way. When I left, I signed stuff and I, I you know, I was done. And, you know, when we went to Sweden and stuff, I'm not saying I didn't get paid. When we went to Sweden and things, it was like, hey, you know, Rick, when we're done, we'll split the money three ways. I go, you guys can do whatever you want. I'll, I'll come 
and in the you may you decide what you want to do you know and i'm i don't need to see your books i don't need to see accounting you know i don't care you know uh just it, we hired Dave Dunlop as a side man. And I said, I was a much more glorified side man, really, you know. Um, and and uh, I don't mind that. Uh, like, I'm perfectly content with that. I mean, I've had, here's a sweet thing. This is the, uh, the to counter that, was that uh, after Triumph made their deal with Roundhill and sold off all their uh, masters, yeah, their master recordings back to Roundhill. The guy that owns Roundhill, Josh Cruz, he came to me and he said, I want to buy your catalog too. I went, okay, great, let's make a deal. So when I sold my catalog to him, you know, uh, the, the Emmett estate, and, and my kids don't have to worry about publishing and, and the ownership of masters, they don't know how to, you know, run a music business kind of a business, and they're not interested in doing it. It would be a horrible thing to saddle them with. So, you know, Thank you very much, Mr. Groose. This is great, you know. And thank you very much, Triumph, because it never would have happened if your deal hadn't gone down. So now I'm getting mine. And hey, you know, so all good. Like, there's nothing bad there, you know. The thing that's nice about writing a book, I mean, it's it's not easy work. It's it's actually hard, you know. And the editing is, is really hard, you oh. know, because you're going to have giant, giant piles of manure. And you're trying to find the diamonds that were inside the mountains of manure, you know, like. Uh, and extract them up. But then when when you're done, you've got all these lovely diamonds that you can do a lovely setting for. And, you know, the the metaphor can continue, but you get the idea. How long like, did it take you, the book, this a book? A couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't doing just that, but I was, you know, on some days it was all I did, you know, put in a whole eight hour day sitting, chewing through, you know, stuff on, on a laptop. And and working on the file, you know, um, and there you was balance there the was, rock star thing. Sorry to interrupt you. Balance the rock star thing really well because every time I talk to someone who writes a book, they're always going, "I I, I want I don't want to deny I'm a rock star. I can't do that because they don't want me to, but I shouldn't. I got to you know I earn this and it's good because I know you enough at least that I don't think I wanted it just to be about triumph. I wanted it to be about life. Yeah. And, and, you know, your book can do the same thing. You, you, obviously, you're, you're going to put something on the cover, like, you know, the marketing department of ECW had a lot of input in the subtitle because there it is. Oh, can, can, we want sort of like an exclusive kind of backstage pass. Yeah, okay, backstage pass. You know, so uh, can we get Rockstar? Yeah, okay. Can, we, well, can the Triumph? I go, yeah, how about this? You know, I thought about it for a couple of nights. I sent him a thing. I go, a backstage pass to Rockstar. What was it? Like adventure, conflict, and triumph. And, and it was like, oh, this is perfect. I go, yeah, I know it is. It's a marketing thing. I, I understand marketing, you know. But the book is not really, it's a backstage pass to a lot of other kinds of stuff that was my life, you know. And and, and your rules. I loved your rules. Yeah. Yeah. Top 10 tips. And I wrote that for a Long and McQuaid catalog originally, that thing. And I was teaching at Humber. I, I can't tell you how many faculty guys from Humber came to me. I'd be, you know, running something off on the photocopier. And a guy would come up behind me and go, hey, man, I saw your thing in the Long and McQuaid magazine. He goes, that was unreal. I'm, I'm going to use that in my class, man. I'm going to be teaching that. I go, great, good. Yeah, it's excellent. You know, guys would come in and go, you know, Rick, uh, like these are guys that are sort of like jazz legends and they're coming to me and they're going, listen, um, you know, you're teaching people about websites and stuff. Can I get some insight into that? You got any uh, like handouts that you give about, I go, yeah, sure. I can share that. You know, so that top 10 tips that went good. Yeah. But you know um, I've said in many interviews, you know, there's 16 chapters in the book. There's a forward and then there's acknowledgements at the end. There's 16 chapters. There's only one chapter. That's the triumph chapter. But I mean, obviously, you're not going to sell the books unless the word triumph is on the cover somewhere, you know. And and so I figured that out, you know. And that's one of the reasons, too, why I'm uh, I'm at peace with the guys. You know, it's their name. It's their brand. But th they got no problem with me putting that on the cover of my book. There was a time when they would have, you know, when lawyers would have started sending me threatening letters, you know, but. You know, those days are long gone. Hey, okay, man. buddy. 
It's been a slice. Thank you very much. And uh, listen, uh, like I said, you're going into January. It'll be all good. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Yeah. So if you want to save some for Easter, that's fine. <laughs> for when the Easter Bunny comes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I don't believe in the Easter Bunny. Bye. <laughs> Hucky, see you, John. See you, man. Mm -hmm.